Thank you everybody for coming. And thank you for allowing me to speak in English uh, because I can't speak in Ukrainian or Russian or any other language. Uh, my, wife, uh, my wife makes fun of me because my wife speaks six languages. She's European uh, and I only speak one. So thank you for letting me speak in English. Uh, for the last 15 years, I have studied economic globalization, uh, many different aspects of economic globalization. But now, I'm not so certain that economic globalization is really occurring. And so today, I won't talk about economic globalization, I'll talk about economic regionalization, the regional structure of the global economy. Total global GDP, gross domestic product, is around $74 trillion per year. About 29% of that is in North America, Canada, Australia, uh, Canada, United States, and Mexico. About 24% is in Western Europe, the European Union, plus Switzerland, Norway, uh, Iceland. And about 23% is in East Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, and of course, China. The entire rest of the world, everything else, is much less than 25% of global GDP. It depends what statistics you use. But outside of the three major economic regions, the rest of the world is only about 20, or at most 25% of global GDP. To put this in perspective, all of Africa, Latin America, Eurasia, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia could simply disappear from the world economy. And there would be some small problems for strategic commodities. There would be a shortage of oil and a shortage of natural gas. But most of the world's value chains, most of the world's economic activity that is integrated into major global manufacturing chains for mobile phones, for automobiles, for aircraft, for computers. Those value chains do not require inputs from the rest of the world. In fact, most of those value chains are completely contained within one region. Mobile phones come from East Asia. Automobiles are either produced in North America, or produced in Europe, or produced in East Asia, but they don't really require many parts from the rest of the world. If we look more closely at each of the regional economies, if you look at North America, more than 50% of all trade in North America is trade within North America. It's a well-integrated economic region. And that 50% only includes trade between the U.S. and Canada, the U.S. and Mexico, and Canada and Mexico. If you think about the U.S. economy, many value chains include parts from Alabama that are assembled into a product in Ohio, north and south in the same value chain. That's not trade. If you were to take apart the American economy and consider it to be like 
five countries. The northeastern U.S., the western U.S., the southern U.S., the midwestern U.S., the mountain U.S. Then an even higher percentage of North American trade would be circular within the region. What's more, North America's economic region is very strongly integrated. About 87% of the entire North American economic zone is within one country, with one set of laws, with one set of regulations, with one currency, with one taxation system. About 87% of the North American economy is within a single political entity. In Europe, Intra-regional trade, trade among European countries, accounts for 69% of all European trade. Europe is not as strongly integrated as North America. Most trade within Europe occurs within the European Union, but the European Union is not as well integrated as the United States. There are many barriers within the European Union. Uh, even where there are no legal barriers, there are linguistic barriers. Uh, personally, before coming to academia, I'm American. I had worked in Maryland, New York, Florida, Alabama, Arizona, and California. It's very easy for an American to be mobile. Uh, if you're Polish or Portuguese, it's much harder to work all around Europe. So relatively weak integration of the European zone. And of course, once the UK leaves the European Union, the total percentage of the European economy that is within one zone will decline down to 78%. Within East Asia, more than 50% of all trade is within the zone. Uh, the figure is actually much higher because just like the United States, China really consists of multiple economic zones. When there's trade between Shanghai and Guangzhou, between the Yangtze River Delta and the Pearl River Delta, well, that's trade between two separate economic regions. But it's not included in international trade statistics because it's within one country. So in reality, intra-regional trade within Asia, the percentage of products that are sold from one firm to another inside Asia is much higher than 50% of Asia's total trade. Asia is, has even less political integration. Only two-thirds of the Asian economy is it within one political entity. Two-thirds is within China. But China is the poorest region of that economic zone. In the United States, value chains are centered on the richest region, the United States. In Europe, value chains are centered on the richest region, the European Union. But in China, I'm oh, sorry, in Asia, value chains are centered on Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. But the shared governance is in China. So there's much less effective integration in East Asia because the general pattern in East Asia is that a Japanese or Korean company is operating in a foreign jurisdiction in China. So if we look at these three economic regions, we have one region, North America, that is very tightly integrated and is the largest region in the world. We have a second region, Europe, that has a moderate level of integration and is the second largest region in the world. 
And we have a third region, Asia, East Asia, which has the weakest integration and is the smallest of the three regions. These hierarchies are repeated in global trade deals. Now, the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, may never be passed. It's, it's very likely that the TTIP will not be accepted by the European Union. But the main trade deal that Europe has with the other economic regions is its negotiations with North America. Similarly, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that the U.S. negotiated with 12, 11 Asian countries. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is politically very controversial. Donald Trump has promised to veto it on his first day in office. But he's been very careful. He said he will suspend it, not cancel it. Because the TPP, again, connects North America with another region of the world. There are no similar multilateral trade institutions to connect Europe and Asia. So North America is the largest economic region, it's the most integrated economic region, and it's also their economic region that is most connected with the others. When you look at the map, it looks like Eurasia is one place, and the Pacific Ocean is very wide. But in fact, it takes a ship two weeks to cross the Pacific from China or Japan to California. It takes a ship four weeks to get from Asia to Western Europe. In economic geography, East Asia is twice as far from Europe as it is from North America. Even the new, very expensive train routes from China to Europe take just as long as the ocean route from China to California. So Asia is actually not to the east of Europe. Asia is really, in economic terms, to the west of California. The North American region is also much richer than the other two regions. When you compare the United States and the European Union, they seem very similar in some ways. But when you compare regions within the United States to regions within the European Union, it becomes clear that the United States is actually much richer than the European Union. The northeastern United States, the area from Virginia to Maine, the area that includes Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, that region is 50% richer than Germany. So the heart, the, the main core of the North American economic region is 50% richer than the main core of the European economic region. It's almost twice as rich as Japan. The GDP per capita of the northeastern US is almost double the GDP per capita of Japan. In fact, if Germany was an American state, <coughs> it would be equivalent to Alabama in the Deep South. In other words, if Germany were an American state, it would be in the periphery of the North American economy. Similarly, if Japan were an American state, it would be equivalent to Mississippi, the poorest state in the American South. Now, when I travel in Tokyo and I see the magnificent infrastructure 
and I take the bullet trains, it looks nothing like Mississippi. And it's hard for me to imagine that Japan and Mississippi are equal. But that's because of a different way of living. Uh, if you go to Mississippi, you'll find many people living in six-bedroom houses with three-car garages on a golf course. It's a very different way of life from Japan. But statistically, statistically, in GDP per capita, Mississippi and Japan are on the same level. The increasing dominance of North America in the global economy is being reinforced by human flows. This is a fantastic internet meme of a MBA student at Harvard University from China holding in the air the two things that really matter to him. The Chinese flag and the American dollar. Now, this particular student might, might go back to China, start a company in China, and become a patriotic contributor to the Chinese state. But most of his companions do not. 4.2 million Chinese students have gone overseas since 1979. Their top destinations are number one, United States, number two, Canada, number three, Australia, number four, United Kingdom. Of those 4.2 million students, only 2.2 million have returned to China. Two million have stayed in their countries of study, most of them in the United States. And I suspect more would have stayed in the United States if they could have gotten green cards. At least half prefer to emigrate. And it's not just Chinese students. I have a colleague who studies Western European emigration to the United States. And he's very concerned because top European academics, scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs routinely leave Europe for North America simply because they can make more money in North America. In other words, these human flows of people are reinforcing a regional hierarchy in the global economy. As a result, all of these fortunes that are being made in China today, all of these Chinese billionaires, are having children who will be American billionaires who have companies in China. In fact, the Harun Rich List, the Chinese equivalent of Fortune magazine, the Harun Rich List has done a survey of rich Chinese multimillionaires. They found that two thirds have sought foreign citizenship or permanent residence for themselves and their families. They're raising their children in the US and Canada, even though they themselves may still live in China. So what's happened in the last 25 years has not been globalization. We all talk about globalization because global trade has increased, global investment has increased, but really if we look at those flows on a specific country by country basis, it hasn't been global trade, it's been regional trade. 
Trade has increased dramatically within Europe. Value chains have become integrated across Asia. But the amount of trade between regions has increased at a much slower rate. And the trade between regions is mostly trade in finished goods. For example, in East Asia, an iPhone may be made in Shenzhen. The screen comes from Japan. The processor comes from Taiwan. The memory chip comes from Korea. The device is assembled in China. And then the final good goes to the United States, or Europe, or Africa. But the chain, the value chain that creates the product, is included all in one region. And if you look at product after product, I, I've done some examples from aircraft. You know, a Boeing aircraft is made almost entirely in, the, in North America. An Airbus is made almost entirely in Europe. You know, an automobile is made almost entirely in one region. And then exported globally. The integration of the world economy is not an integration of the world economy. The integration of the world economy is the integration of three regional economies. And everybody else buys and sells finished goods from those three integrated economic regions. I think this has very important implications for economic development and growth strategies. Countries that are integrated into economic regions can attempt to improve their position in the region. Poland can move up from making simple manufactured goods to making more complicated manufactured goods. But countries that are isolated from the major regions, like India, face a very different development challenge because they have to develop entire value chains within their own countries. They don't have the opportunity to upgrade within existing value chains. Thank you for listening. I do hope you, thank you. I do hope you have questions and comments. Questions and arguments. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm sorry I was a little bit late, but still I think I, I, I've heard enough to have a couple of questions. Uh, um, first, um, first question is why it seems to me that you kind of over overrate the value of GDP per capita when you compare uh, Germany with Alabama or Japan with Mississippi or I mean Japan has much more population, much bigger population for example. So it has bigger GDP and it has yes. the uh, it produces things that Mississippi doesn't produce. That's why it's more valuable. Um, so I mean uh, don't you think that this counter argument make uh, your? I mean, I, I totally agree with your cleavages of world economic regions, but maybe they are not so uh, great as you are presented. Uh, the second is about the uh, when you say that all added value is created mostly inside one particular economic region, but what about the ideas and technologies, sure. because technologies for iPhone, designed for iPhone, that makes the most of its added value. It's not the screen, right? They were created, they're still created in the United States, yeah. and they, they go from one region to yeah. another. Yeah. Sure. Uh, first on, on GDP, GDP is not perfect for everything, but GDP is very good as a measure of 
productivity. After all, that's what GDP is. It's the product produced on average by the people in a place. Uh, my point about Japan is that the average GDP, I'm sorry, the average productivity of the Japanese economy is equivalent to the average productivity of the Mississippi economy. Of course, it's a much bigger economy, it's a different society, it's structured differently. Granted, granted, granted. I think it's important to put it in perspective that Japan is not particularly a high value producing place in the world. We imagine that it is. We imagine Sony technology and robots and in our imagination Japan is a leading center of global innovation and productivity. In fact, by North American standards, it's pretty mediocre. That's my only point. About value chains, uh, yes, your point is very good. Much of the value in the value chain comes from design. There we don't have good statistics, but there the qualitative evidence suggests that the preponderance of the North American region is even greater. That is, if you look at the leading sectors in the 21st century economy, and imagine where the top value activity is done in those sectors. Well, information technology, Google, Apple, Facebook, Snapchat, you know, you have to go very far down the list to find a European company. Uh, smartphones, sure, Samsung makes lots of smartphones, but they run Android, right, which is where the value is being created. Uh, you know, if you look at the leading, leading companies in the leading sectors, they're not exclusively North American. There's plenty of innovation going on in Europe and Japan. But they're disproportionately North American. Now that's a qualitative understanding, but I think it has a lot of validity. Please, especially the undergraduates. Uh, You're not. Maybe, an maybe a short <laughs> question just to, to continue the question. Yes, yes, please. Alex, please. It, it's really, uh, how do you think uh, the structure, I mean, uh, the structure of GDP is also very important. Uh, and uh, because, uh, as I know, for the United States, it's about 40% of GDP is not material. Uh, product uh, is uh, intellectual property. Uh, I don't know the right. statistic, but yeah, it's certainly so, it's large. Yeah. So in this case, uh, what we see is uh, that, for example, Hollywood uh, collect money from the whole of the world. Yes. And it's it's another trading. It's also trading, but it's not uh, the trading between firms, uh, but it's also collection of like trading, like collection of money because they trade. They sell uh, the movie, uh, they sell the songs, uh, ideas, and, and so forth. From this point of view, can we say that uh, globalization is lo globalization? But, I still don't not think, regionalization. I still think it's regional, regionalization, but let me, let me take a different approach to your question, or your comment. If we think of the world economy in terms of three sectors, agriculture, industry, services. Very roughly, we could say they correspond to the pre-modern economy, agriculture, the modern economy, industry, the post-modern economy, services. Many countries have been successful in making the transition to the modern economy. Even the old Soviet Union was very successful at building dams, building roads, you know, building cars, build, you know, building things, the modern economy. Japan has been incredibly successful at building things. But the North American economy has 
very aggressively made the transition to the postmodern economy, where the future value lies. And it's not just Hollywood. Let me give you a very mundane example. We can go to an old-fashioned Ukrainian cafe and get a cup of coffee that they make with an instant coffee packet, add water, and they sell you the coffee, and it's very cheap. Or you can go to coffee house and get an espresso or a cappuccino and pay ten times as much. Some people, if you have a modern mindset, you would say, why should I pay ten times as much? Coffee is coffee. But if you have a postmodern mindset, what we're really paying for is the experience of having a certain taste, a certain look, a certain environment in which to drink your coffee. You're paying for the free Wi-Fi. Right? You're paying for the entire experience. That's the postmodern economy. You can go to any small town in rural Alabama, and there's a Starbucks. Even Alabama and Mississippi have made the transition from an old-fashioned diner where you can just get, as my mother says, coffee. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, just a, something that they made in a pot and poured for you. They've made the transition, even in Alabama and Mississippi, from drinking low-quality, mass-produced, modern coffee to drinking high-quality, artisanal cappuccinos from Starbucks. Now, if you have a modern mindset, coffee's coffee, they have the same value. But in terms of neoclassical economics, the subjective theory of value, and in terms of how we measure GDP, a Starbucks coffee contributes 10 times as much to GDP. That's the transition that North America has made to a large extent. Europe has made to a moderate extent. In Berlin, you can certainly get fancy coffees, and you have an interesting you have local movie industry and lots of art, and it exists. Uh, and that East Asia has made to a much lower extent. So services, uh, you know how to increase the GDP of your country. Everybody has uh, to, to wash uh, the uh, car of the neighbor. Because if you wash your car, you uh, put no in GDP. But if you wash the car yeah. of your neighbor and he wash your car, then you put $20 to GDP. Right. So you are right. And that's a problem in for example, I've written about growth in China, that much of Chinese growth, we all think China has grown 12% you know, per year for, for 40 years. I said, no, no, a big part of that growth was things that Chinese people used to get in their work unit. My employer just provides lunch for me. Now Chinese people buy from a restaurant. Same food, but now it's GDP. Okay. But there's one step beyond that. The difference is between a simple service, your neighbor washes your car, to a sophisticated service, your neighbor does expert auto detailing and produces a car for you that looks beautiful. That's the transition to the postmodern economy. Please. Um, or, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, statistics really gives us possibility and capacity. Louder so, so everyone can hear. Uh -huh. Pretend I'm on the other uh -huh. side of the room. Is it yeah. really possible to describe regionaliz regionalization as a current, real current trend? And, uh, uh, and uh, what will happen in the next few decades? In sure. This, this is something that uh, I'm currently writing about. The paper that you see here is very early work. It's a working paper. It's not a published paper or a final product or a book. I would love to have PhD students 
who want to work on regionalization. My own guess is that regionalization is a continuing trend, and my guess is that it has important implications for development. For example, to make it personal, in Ukraine, there's a big debate about economic orientation towards Europe and economic orientation towards Russia. And that debate was the ultimate cause of Russia's invasion of Crimea, Russia's invasion of eastern Ukraine, the, 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 the spark that caused these problems was Ukraine, Ukrainians, thought it was in their interest to orient towards Europe than to orient towards Russia. Well, I think if you believe that, that Ukraine's future is to orient towards Europe, you've accepted my thesis. Because you've said that it's better to start working your way up in a value chain that's integrated into a major world economic region, that's better than to be isolated as part of a CIS, you know, Commonwealth of Independent States, Eurasian economy, with no connections to the world. Now, I don't know that that's true. That's my guess. And I think that most Ukrainians share that guess. But you tell me. I'm very curious to know how people feel about integration with Europe. Okay. Any other questions, comments, arguments? Що ж, давайте ще раз подякуємо нашому гостю. I'm very easy to find online. There's only one, there's only one Salvatore Babonis in the world. Uh, I guarantee you, it's a very rare, there, there are no others. Uh, I'd love to hear from students. Uh, it's easy to find me. If you don't want to write to me, you can even just go to my website and sign up for my newsletter. Uh, and then if you get something interesting in the newsletter, you can write to me then. Uh, but I'd really love to hear from students. That's why I'm here, uh, to meet students. So please be in touch, and thank you for attending. Thank you.